This is episode 28 of Ethics and Culture Cast from the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. Welcome to episode 28 of Ethics and Culture Cast. I'm Ken Hellenius, the communications specialist at the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture at the University of Notre Dame. In this episode, we chat with Chuck Konzelman and Carrie Solomon, the Hollywood producers and directors who brought the feature film Unplanned to the big screen. They were on campus recently, along with Abby Johnson, whose story is told in the film, for a panel discussion hosted by the DeNicola Center. Let's sit down with Chuck and Carrie for this fascinating conversation. Well, Chuck Konzelman and Carrie Solomon, thank you kindly for being with us today. Thank you for having us. So uh, tell us a bit about yourselves. I know, uh, Chuck, you have done time in South Bend before. Yes, I know what this uh, wintry uh, March weather looks and feels like. It was not a surprise getting here. The false spring. Yeah, yeah, until the until the, the actual eight-minute spring shows up. That's right, that's right. Uh, I graduated in 82, and so I've been gone for quite some time. And what have you done in the meantime? Uh, did I mean, I started off in public accounting, of all things, for a few years, realized I sh- my life shouldn't be spent there, uh, dabbled with a couple other things, and then around... 1990, uh, Carrie, who was my best friend, and we'd been in another business together, said, hey, you want to go make some movies? And we, you know, constructive naivete, we're like, yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> Having absolutely no idea how tough it was going to be. What you were getting into. Well, Carrie, tell us a bit about uh, your journey. Where are you from and, and what have you been doing? Uh, originally, I was from Brooklyn. My mom and dad divorced, unfortunately, and uh, my mom moved out to Jersey, and her proclamation to me was, You're, we're going to have a place to live that has grass on it. And uh, considering that all I knew was concrete, steel, and broken bottles uh, in Brooklyn, the high watermark of New York, uh, this was exciting, you know, and it was a different world. But when I moved in, uh, the kid next door, that was Chuck, and he's been following me around ever since. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Uh, and where did you study? And uh, yeah, okay. I'm interested to hear this. One. Yeah, this is this is a good one. Unlike all the smart people, uh, I studied in Brooklyn, very prestigious place, uh, East 15th Street and Kings Highway, <laughs> right on the corner. And uh, that was the extent of my t- my my schooling. So uh, no, I, I never went to college. Uh, I never had a fascination, you know, I, I don't know if it was the New York uh, chutzpah or the, the hustle, but it's a different world. You know, I wanted to go out and uh, make it in the world. And I, college seemed to me like a detour from that. Sure. So. Well, so now how did you get into movies and eventually drag Chuck in? Uh, we just, we were, you know, I've known Chuck forever since, like I said, we grew up as kids and, and, uh, what happened was we were in a business, we were very successful, but there was something wrong on the inside. It just didn't seem right. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit, to be honest, because I think that the Lord, we had matured to a point now where, uh, we were ready. And I think that we had learned all the stuff we were supposed to learn. And this one day out of nowhere, I mean, it drops on. I I mean, I never wanted to make movies. Chuck never wanted to make movies. And then suddenly I just looked at him. We were at a big convention that we were speaking at. And I said, do you want to go to Hollywood? And he looked at me and said, yeah. And that was it. (laughs) Next day we know, you know, a couple of days later we're in our, in a Jeep and we have a U-Haul, which you're not supposed to do. That's a whole nother story. (laughs) Pulling stuff through the mountains and the snow and stuff like that. And and, then like the great pioneers of the past, we arrive in in, uh, Los Angeles. Go west, young man, Kennedy. That's right. Wow. So... Let's talk a bit about Unplanned, since that's, of course, why, why we're all here together this week. Um, why this story? What uh, inspired you to choose and bring to the screen? I don't think we story? chose. I think we got chosen. Um, we were sitting about, I don't know, maybe six years ago in our usual haunt, which is a coffee shop, sitting against our own shadows on the wall, because that's how much time we spent there. And uh, a woman of our acquaintance, Megan Harrington, came up and she... Uh, she handed us a book and said, you guys need to make this a movie. 
And so we were like, uh, okay. And um, I read it and was impressed by the story. Uh, it obviously wasn't a Hollywood story per se. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's a, an ardently pro-life story, and we worked in an ardently pro-choice town. But we felt that there was something important to be said there. So he read it, felt the same way. Uh, we went about trying to acquire the rights. We actually got stalled for a bit, um, then did, and then uh, went out to Texas to interview Abby and her mom and dad and her husband and spent about a week or 10 days there interviewing everyone in her life. And then uh, in prayer, we kind of got uh, put on hold again for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, Chuck's giving you the sanitized version. Basically, we're sitting in the coffee shop and we're planning to do a Western Again, we're going to do it with Clint Eastwood. We have everything figured out. It's all going to work. And, uh, you know, we got a great, great project, and we're really excited. And then Megan drops the book on us. And I look at the book, and I'm like, yeah, okay, chick flick. Not going to happen. Okay? And, uh, but I made the mistake of praying on it. <laughs> and, Don't do and that. I, yeah, yeah, and I, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I said, Lord, we're making a Western, right? And God was like, no. You went from and I'm unforgiven like, to unplanned. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, the uns have undone us. And so he's like, no, you're going to, I want you to do this. And I'm like, okay, let me just ask that in a different way. Because I figured out, you see, being from Brooklyn, we figured that if I, and, and from New Jersey, New Jersey after that, that if you ask something in a different way, maybe the Lord will change the answer. <laughs> I've learned that it doesn't work. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Uh, no. He's smarter than we are. Yeah. But uh, so I said, so we'll do the Western first and then we'll do unplanned, right? No, do the unplanned. And so I was like, oh, man. So I, I read the book. He actually came into the office the next day and he had that look of someone who was like convicted by the spirit, yeah. very quiet, very, you know, to himself. And he's like, you need to read this. And I'm like, uh oh, I've seen this before. Right. That means we're doing this. We've known each other way too long. We, and, uh, we, we know what this looks like. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs> Wow. Well, so now you've alluded to some of the challenges in bringing this to to the screen. What what have been some of the some of the challenges? Because I know the production was really very quiet. Well, uh, you know, there are certain I mean, if a person has any thought of God and the devil and of right and wrong, you know, there comes a tremendous burden when you decide to take on, like the Bible says, that this is the devil's world. So when you decide to go against every concept that he's pushing, that is not an easy thing. So even if you don't believe in the, in the devil per se, we do believe in that. So you have adversarial attacks, you have spiritual battle on every front, every moment. But even if you didn't believe in the devil, like I said, you still have a good part of society and the world that is in total opposition to what you're doing. Yeah. So we've had to deal with raising money. Uh, you know, the cable channels will not I'll take our money for ad buys. Yeah, we finally finished our marketing raise last week, literally. Oh my and this gosh. has been a two and a half year process. And we're two weeks away from the movie. And right, yeah. the movie comes out intended. Uh, Lifetime will not accept our advertising dollars. Uh, Hallmark. Hallmark will not accept our advertising. HGTV will not. K Love will not. Air One will not. Wow. So that's how pervasive this resistance is that basically you don't get to speak against abortion in our culture. There's well, or on a lot of other issues as well. I mean, one of the things that we all, you know, we're dealing with the fact that, you know, uh, the internet. Uh, there are certain things that are happening on there. We're being closed down. You know, the MPAA giving us an R rating, uh, which also makes us, by the way, that, you know, a new thing now is we've been, uh, we can't advertise on radio till after nine o'clock in the evening. Because of the R rating. Because of the R rating and and that it's a red label. So, you know, and we have no profanity, no vulgarity, no sex, uh, nothing in there. Right. But here we are. It's a political R. So we are politically taking on the powers that be. And just for your listeners, just so that they know not to be afraid of the R, you know, we've had Glenn Beck come out and say this is a political R. This is not. Reverend Franklin Graham has endorsed it. Sister Rose Paquette, a nun in a habit, is basically saying you need to go see this. And we have 
uh, Archbishop Nauman, who is the pro-life secretary uh, chief for the for the Catholics Catholic of North Bishops, America. Yeah, yep. yeah. He has said, he actually said during the vigil mass before the March for Life, uh, if there is one movie you see this year, you must see Unplanned. Wow. And he gave, he just went on raving about it. And he's actually got an article endorsing the film that's slated to be published in the Wall Street Journal the day before we come out next week. And you got to remember, I mean, unless you're not paying attention to the culture war, which is kind of difficult not to be nowadays, right? right? right. There are great forces of antagonism that to our position on life overall, family, traditional values and stuff like that. But one of the things is there are such things as political motivations in Hollywood. The MPAA is run by a former Obama assistant secretary of state. He's 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 pro, pro, pro abortion. And, you know, they'll fall back on saying, well, we get 10 parents to come in and look at it. Well, yes, but those are parents from the 90210 zip code or thereby adjacent. So the odds of finding maybe more than one of them being pro-life are pretty remote given Southern California. Well, you are actually interviewing two out of the three pro-life conservative Republicans in California. And the third one's our confessor, so. (laughs) We hope. Wow. Wow. Um, Okay, so... In spite of the challenges, this mm-hmm. this film is is coming out, and I guess you know the question is, what are your hopes for the impact that this film can have? And I know that's a very broad question. Well, there, there's a couple different answers. I mean, the, the 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 big kind of overarching hope is that this can become Uncle Tom's Cabin for this issue. That basically, by virtue of Presenting the issue of abortion, allowing people to see what it looks like. Uh, yeah, and and, the, and, and, I, and these are the least invasive forms of abortion. These are first trimester abortions, a suction abortion, and an RU four eighty six. These are not, you know, second trimester dismemberments. These are not uh, third trimester. The born alive kind of things yeah, that are in the news. It's now. not yeah. that. This is the routine, you know, um, everyday form of abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, we're hoping that we can kind of dispel this willful blindness that's taken hold of, over society that this isn't a person, this isn't a human being. You know, um, Abby saw this. She was eight years an abortion clinic director and it changed her in an instant. The great irony is that almost no one ever sees one of the she – she was performing an ultrasound-guided abortion. She was holding the wand. Ultrasound ab- guided abortions are incredibly rare, incredibly rare. Most abortionists have never seen an abortion. They operate blind. And ironically, ultrasound guided abortions are much safer for women. There's far less chance of damaging the uterine wall. That's why that particular abortionist did it that way. Sure. The reason it's not done more frequently is that it would cost an extra three to four minutes per patient. Three to four minutes. And, you know, Planned Parenthood, when they schedule a surgeon for a Saturday morning is typically when they'll come in. They're scheduling maybe 35 or 40 procedures, 30 to 40. And when you take four minutes times 40 procedures, all of a sudden, that's a lot of extra hours. You maybe have to hire a second surgeon. Nobody wants to do it. Cuts into their revenue. Cuts into the bottom line. You know, if they have to hire another surgeon. And their stance is, well, the the process is completely, completely safe. So it's completely, completely safe. Why would you have to try to make it safer? Additionally, I think uh, what we're looking to do is we're not looking to blame. This is not a movie of condemnation. We're not saying, look at them, they're so terrible. Uh, we tried to show the truth on both sides. Uh, everything you're going to see in the movie is, is true. Everything was written either in her book, in interviews, or, or court transcripts. Uh, and there'll be a lot of people say, no, 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 then, but we, we know that it is. Um, the thing what we're trying to do is bring a movie about redemption, about hope, about forgiveness, about love. We're saying, look, we're, we're, we all have problems in our life. We've all done things that are terrible uh, or contemplated things like that. That's not what this is about. What this is about is that you have since 1980, 1.5 billion, that's with a B, children have been murdered across the world. Now, just put that number in your head for a second and then realize that's without the RU486 pill which probably doubles that number. But let's just say it's 1.5. That's a seventh of the human population on the earth. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's let's remember what the devil is doing here is he's extincting mankind, which is his exact goal. Okay, that's number one. You know, I like to ask people, what's the first thing that the devil did after Jesus' birth? And they kind of think about it for a second. Slaughter of the innocents. Yep. Why? Because it hurts God the most. So this movie is about redemption, especially for anyone who's been involved in an abortion. Now, would we like it to stop young kids from doing abortion and ruining their lives? Yes, of course. But And it's for men as much as this is for women, because in our screenings, we've seen 40 or 50 percent of the men come out. They're totally devastated because they realize they drove their girlfriend to get it. They forced her to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's about redemption for these post-abortive women. There must be a billion of them in the world since you've done a billion and a half abortions, right? Yeah. So there has to be a a billion uh, post-abortive women. So what we're hoping for is that the movie allows them to go down to the train station with this baggage, wait for the train to come in. Okay, and leave the baggage on the platform, get on the train to freedom. And what we're finding is that women are saying, I'm free. I, I'm, I get it. I, 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 this has saved me. These women are suffering. Some of these women that we've talked to 50 and 60 years ago, they had abortion. Wow. So this is an epidemic. This is not something. And we just want to reach out and, and, and love on everyone who's involved because we're all in this together. Yeah, we had a female psychologist who, and we all know that there's this epidemic of antidepressant use out there in America right now. Her contention was that 100% of her adult female patients who were using antidepressants were post-abortive. Wow. She said there's a straight, flat, one-to-one correspondence. And, and, and this is, we should be expecting this because this whole idea of celebrate your abortion, shout your abortion, yeah. gifts appropriate for someone who's just had an abortion— as human beings, we know this is wrong. We sense this is wrong. You know, uh, G.K. Chesterton, who was here at Notre Dame for a while, what he said of abortion, he said, you know, it is murder, not just of the stripe of Herod, but of the stripe of Cain. That is, we are slaughtering our own flesh and blood. Sisters, yeah. And then kind of in tandem with that, he also said that every political act is a, is a religious act. And this whole idea to this Catholics, we get to ignore this out there. Uh, you know, and 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 this stuff is coming home to roost because the pre-med students at Notre Dame, if they think they can go out now in, into future careers and not have not be forced into participation with this stuff, and that, that's a fantasy world. The, the, we, we're we're quickly losing in American society the the ability to raise an objection of conscience, and and society is really starting to gang tackle on that. I mean, we have the governor of the state of New York saying pro-lifers are no longer welcome in right, New York. Right. And and this you know this goes back to his father actually who spoke here a couple times at Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. I mean, ironically, I had, I had heard him when I was an undergrad, and then I actually recently called up and read his speech here, uh, which was a couple years after I left in 1984, and he was presenting the nuance how abortion was so nuanced, and it would be terrible if government didn't provide it for low income women, if high income women had access to it, and how basically. You know, he's like, well, we need to find something better. But in the meantime, we need to subsidize abortions and, you know, we need to go forward in a big way. And, and, and there was the very strong hope that the bishops would not come out and condemn any political party that was strongly in support of it. And that's a that's born bitter fruit. And, 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 and now, you know, we're living in the world of what that advice, you know, has brought to pass. Yeah. But what I think that Unplanned is going to do is I think that... <coughs> On March 29th, I think the world is, we know it. And I, and, and I know that every filmmaker wants to believe what I'm about to say. This is not us. We, did, we had no part in this. You know, we were the vessels the Lord used to get this out. I mean, there was miracles on set. There were healings. There were all, I could tell you things that would take hours, which if a person denied the presence of God, they would become a holy believer if they were on set. It was unbelievable. Wow. But I will tell you that I think what's going to happen on March 29th is all the rhetoric, all the lies on both sides, uh, all the marketing, like a uh, hamburger company that markets its hamburgers, okay? Uh, you know, they're very efficient, right? People drive to a McDonald's because marketing, right? And, and they like this, or Wendy's or Burger, or whoever it is. Any form of marketing, you know, the lie about it being a clump of tissue, the lie about it not being terrible, the lie about it's, oh, it's just like cleaning your teeth and when you go to the dentist, 
uh, is all going to change because what you're going to see for the first time is you're going to see without a doubt the absolute truth that this is a baby. Now, what you do with that, you can either kill it or you can keep it. But there are no more choices after this movie. In other words, kill it or keep it. Once you know, you can't unknow. And so if you choose to kill it, that's between you and your creator. Creator. If you choose to keep it, obviously also between you and your creator. But there will not be anyone who will come before the creator or before their friends or anyone else and say, oh, I didn't, I didn't know. know. It, w- it wasn't. So what the Lord is doing is a divine. I heard this the other day in, uh, uh, in church, and I thought it was great. The priest was talking, and he said, we are in a time of great mercy. And the Lord, it has been prophesied that there will be many acts of great mercy that the Lord's going to do to enlighten man so that he can save as many of us from destruction and from despair and an eternal doom, right? This is a divine act of mercy because when he shows you the truth, once you know, you can't unknow. My dad is 84-year-old Jewish atheist liberal. Now, when I talk liberal, I'm talking, I don't know if there's anything bigger (laughs) <laughs> than the, 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 the L, the capitalized L. Yeah. But if there is, my dad's there, okay, right? My dad calls me up and he says to me, hey, baby, baby, wh- wh- what are you doing? And I said, I'm making a movie, Dad. And he said, oh, send me something, send me something. So I sent him a clip of this, something we call the barrel scene where they're actually wheeling the, the babies out in barrels to throw them away. And uh, he starts to choke up. He says, I, 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 I'll call you tomorrow. And hangs up on me. And just for the listeners so that they understand, too, and this happens in real life. It happened to Sean Carney. and It happened at the clinic where we go sometimes and pray. Uh, The pro-lifers will typically ask the driver of the medical waste truck to just park the barrel for a few moments while they can pray over it and give those hundreds of unborn children the only funeral or the closest thing to a funeral that they will ever have. And it's heartbreaking when it happens. It's a very powerful scene in the film. Yeah. And so my dad calls me the next day. Very summer. Now, you got to remember, this is a man who, when I was a boy, would set me up with women and say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If you get it pregnant, we'll just have an abortion. I didn't know better. I mean, here's my dad telling me, you know, run after girls, do whatever. Oh, OK. I'm 12 years old, 11, 13, whatever it was. I don't remember. 14, 15. So anyway, so that's how far liberal he was. Right. Um, and my dad calls me the next day and he very quiet says to me uh, that. That thing, you, that piece of the film you sent me, this movie is going to change the world. He says, um, and then he kind of pauses for a second because he's choked up, and he says, and this I thought was profound. He says, "You showed us what we didn't want to see." And I was, th- I was struck when he said us. Well, who is us? Because I'm talking to my dad on the phone. Yeah. He's talking about the other side. And then he says, we need to make laws to stop this. And this is my dad, pro-choice for 84 years. Wow. Okay? I mean, from the moment he came out of the, the womb, he was pro-choice. Okay? And this is because once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so that is why I believe this is a divine act of mercy. If you can take a person like that and in 10 seconds change his position without having to argue, amazing. Wow. Well, I was going to ask you, gentlemen, about the vocation of the filmmaker, but I think you've actually just answered the, the question right there without asking. Yeah, we're in for life. This is it. And I would say to any of your listeners who want to get into film or TV or radio, or it's a mighty work because I will say that the media is the most profoundly powerful thing. I believe that if Paul or John or Peter or James or any of the apostles, Andrew, were here today— They wouldn't go door to door preaching the gospel. I'm sure they would do that in their extra time. But what they would be doing is they would make a movie. Because a movie right now, I can can take my movie on my cell phone and I can send it to anyone in the world, anywhere in the world, 
And I can reach tens, hundreds of millions of people. And the profound effect of media is when I was growing up, I was poor. Like I said, I grew up in Brooklyn and moved up to New Jersey. There was something called Life Magazine. It used to have these magnificent pictures sure. on it. I'll never forget one day I came down from my, the tenement I was in, and on the, on the stairs was a Life Magazine, and it showed a Vietnamese man on his knees with a soldier blowing, the, blowing his head off. Very famous. Uh, very famous. Yeah. It ended the Vietnam War. Yeah. So I will say to the people out there, the civil rights movement, or uh, the segregation and so forth in the 60s uh, when the the African-Americans were uh, being oppressed, right? What is the visual image that you remember? And I guarantee you, everyone will say, I remember the water hoses, the German shepherds in midair, and the batons beating down these people. Change the world, right? Because once you see it, it leaves a profound effect on the soul. That's the power of the movie and why people need to see this and show this to everyone because it will change the world. Well, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Konzelman, who've brought the film Unplanned to the screen, thank you kindly for coming to Notre Dame to be with us, and thank you for telling this story. Thank you for having us. And- yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you and everyone. Thank you to Chuck and Carrie for the excellent conversation. Find links to video of our panel discussion event with them and Abby Johnson, as well as details about the movie Unplanned in the show notes. Subscribe to Ethics and Culture Cast so that you can always get the latest episodes by visiting ethicscenter.nd.edu slash podcast. We would love your feedback. Please give us a review wherever you get your podcasts and email your suggestions to cecpodcast at nd.edu. Our theme music is I Dunno by Grapes, licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution License. We'll see you next time on Ethics and Culture Cast. Until then, make good decisions. Music